All right, welcome everyone. I'm Norman Wahlberger, and we're uh, here at the University of New South Wales talking today about simplicities and simplicial complexes. This is on the road to establishing uh, simple, simplicial homology. And uh, so, simplicities are generalizations of triangles, and triangles are naturally uh, very simple, basic objects that we can use to uh, construct spaces. And basically a simplex is a, a higher dimensional generalization of uh, a triangle. So triangles take higher dimensions, then we get simplices. <clears throat> okay, so these are useful things to uh, say a little bit about. So let's uh, start with just the idea of uh, convex uh, combinations and hulls. If we're working in a two-dimensional uh, vector space and we have two vectors, let's say uh, V1 and V2, then we know that if these two vectors are independent, then we can write every uh, vector in the plane as a linear combination of V1 and V2. Okay, that's uh, well and good, but it's uh, interesting also to consider some special linear combinations, the ones that result in vectors going through the two endpoints of the vectors. So the line determined by the two vectors, that is characterized by certain types of linear combinations. It's given by vectors of the form lambda, uh, say, uh, maybe I'll write it like this. We'll write it in parametric form as V1 plus lambda times the vector V2 minus V1, which is this vector here. So plus lambda times V2 minus V1. So that's obviously a parametric form for that line. And if we rewrite that as uh, 1 minus lambda times V1 plus lambda times V2. Then we recognize that we're getting a linear combination of a particular kind. It's a linear combination where the sum of the coefficients happens to be 1. That's a characterization of that line. And then if we uh, look a little bit more carefully at the actual line segment between the tips of V1 and V2, so that line segment is characterized by things of this form where lambda goes between 0 and 1. Okay? So if lambda is between 0 and 1, then we describe the the line segment between V1 and V2. And in fact, this uh, number lambda can be thought of as a coordinate on this line segment. So if, uh, if lambda is close to zero, then, then we are close to if lambda is close to zero, then we're close to V1. While on the other hand, if lambda is close to one, then the point is close to V2. So lambda is some kind of measure of uh, how far apart where we are on this segment. <coughs> All right, so this has a nice and important generalization to three points, say in the plane. If we have three vectors, V1, V2, and V3, and we want to describe the triangle formed by the three endpoints, that triangle there. Then that triangle can be described by an appropriate linear combination of V1, V2, and V3. It's of the form, uh, say, uh, I'll write it lambda 1, V1, plus lambda 2, V2, plus lambda 3 V3, where, first of all, all the lambda i's are between 0 and 1, and the sum of the lambdas 
equals one. That's kind of a two-dimensional generalization of describing a line segment, how to describe a triangle in a vector space. By an appropriate linear combination of the vectors, where the coefficients are all positive between zero and one, and where the sum of the uh, coefficients is one. And these, these numbers, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, are sometimes called barycentric coordinates. Barycentric coordinates for a point in the triangle, say x. All right, so this is uh, one way we can think about uh, creating higher dimensional analogs of, of triangles. Okay. By, uh, there's an obvious sort of ladder of ideas. Here we had two points and we took a, a combination of those two points. Here we have three points. We're taking a, a combination, a convex combination. Always coefficients between zero and one. Coefficients adding up to one. This is a one way of, of generalizing what uh, a, a triangle is to a notion of a simplex in a higher dimensional space. So, so for example, in three dimensional space, if we take, I'll say x, y, z, there's our space, and now we take four points given by four vectors, v1, v2, v3, maybe I won't always draw the things, well, then we get another point, v4, then those four points, if they're in sort of general position, so if they're not all lying in a plane, then those four points determine a solid figure, which is some kind of tetrahedron. And that tetrahedron uh, is, is a, a simplex and it can be described algebraically in exactly the same way as we've described the triangle over there. So the tetrahedron, or simplex, formed by four general points or general vectors, v1, v2, v3, v4, in three-dimensional space, can be described um, by the parametric kind of form, lambda 1, v1, plus lambda 2, v2, plus lambda 3, v3, plus lambda 4, v4. So any vector of that form will be in the, this convex hull if, first of all, all the coefficients are between 0 and 1, and if the sum of the coefficients equals 1. This is a vector, a vector way of describing a tetrahedron or a simplex um, given the, the four corners, four vertices. And it's not too hard to, to generalize that. We can describe a, an N a simplex in the same kind of way. So if, if we're working in A uh, N, then we would generally need n plus one points and or vectors and let's say uh, let's call them v0, v1 up to vn. I'll change the notation a little bit so we're starting at zero. So v0, v1, vn are n points, n plus one points in general position. And that means that they're not all lying in some hyperplane. 
then we can describe, we can define sort of the, an n-dimensional simplex in terms of a similar linear combination of those uh, n plus 1 vectors. So we can define, maybe I'll go up here, so then we can define the, the n-simplex and maybe we'll write uh, delta sub n so for n-dimensional simplex is going to be described by similarly some combination, any combination, lambda 1, uh, maybe we should lambda 0, v0 plus lambda 1, v1 plus all the way up to lambda n, vn where these scalars all have the property that they're between 0 and 1 and so that they sum up to One. So this gives us a very concrete way of talking about what an n-dimensional simplex is. <clears throat> There's also a, a more standard form. So a standard uh, form for simplices. I'll just mention this is an alternate way of thinking about what a simplex is or how to obtain them. Is to uh, think in the following way. So let's suppose we look in two-dimensional, uh, well, two-dimensional vector space and say, uh, we'll choose basis vectors E1 and E2. So this is the basis vector 1, 0. And this is the basis vector 0, 1. Then if we look at combinations of these two vectors, convex combinations of these two vectors, then we get what you might call a, a one-dimensional simplex. one-dimensional simplex or a, a line segment. And one could easily write down a parametric description of it because these vectors are particularly simple. If we go into three dimensions, maybe I'll yeah, okay, use a standard form. So maybe the x1 direction, x2 direction, x3 direction. And we choose basis vectors E1, E2, and E3. So this is just the standard basis vectors. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. then the convex hull of these three vectors in exactly the same sense as we are talking about before. This thing here is uh, an example of, the, of a triangle. A kind of a canonical triangle. Maybe we could call it del 2. So it's a triangle or two simplex. And similarly, if you want, and this is quite of equilaterally, it's obviously an equilateral kind of object. So if you want to go into higher dimensions, well, you could at least try to draw a picture. Uh, so in, in four-dimensional space, we have x1, x2, x3, x4 axes. And we look at unit vectors. E1, E2, E3, and E4. And again, these are just standard basis vectors. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. 
then if we apply the same a kind of tetrahedral construction to these four vectors in these four dimensional space, then we're going to get a tetrahedron that the convex hull will be a tetrahedron, a three-dimensional simplex. And note that it lies in the plane, or lies in the hyperplane uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals 1. Just the same way this one lies in the plane x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1, and just as the same way that this lies in the line x1 plus x2 equals 1. Suggesting that to, for consistency, we should also have a prior a picture in the one dimensional space. So in the one dimensional space, with just one axis x1 and one unit vector e1, which is the vector 1. In this case, there's only one point. And so the simplex is just that point there. So that's the zero dimensional simplex. It's just a point. which of course also lies in, lies in the point x1 equals 1, sort of for consistency in this uh, chain of pictures. All right, and we can easily continue this in uh, higher dimensions. So we can talk about equilateral simplices in any dimensions just by taking the convex hull of the basis vectors in a uh, space of one dimension higher. Take the convex hull of those, uh, those vectors and you're getting a, an n-dimensional simplex. So somehow algebraically, it's all relatively straightforward uh, in some sense. All right, so these are the basic building blocks that we're now going to, to use to build up some kinds of topological spaces called simplicial complexes. And it's a kind of framework in which homology is reasonably pleasant to say precisely what it, what it is and what's going on and how to compute it. So, simplicial complexes. So the idea is that we want to build up a space using simplices. But not necessarily all of the same dimension. We're willing to use different dimensional simplices to, in building up our space, a little bit like Lego blocks. So for example, we might have a tetrahedron, just to give a three-dimensional example. So a tetrahedron, so there's a, a three-dimensional simplex, and that's a solid tetrahedron. Thinking of it as a solid object. Okay. And uh, then together, then we might, um, say, build a triangle on that side there. So there's a, a triangle, and, um, and maybe, Maybe I'll, I'll try to draw it. There's, there's the solid tetrahedron. And there's our, our triangle. And I'll make it a different color. Triangle. And maybe uh, another triangle. Okay. So there would be another, another triangle. And then maybe we could add a line segment. Uh, so we will connect this one 
uh, well, to this one. So this is supposed to be a one-dimensional simplex. Okay. So this is some kind of object created from, from simplices according to some reasonable rules. So the rule is that, well, that, that any two simplices um, are either disjoint They don't intersect. Or if they do intersect, or they meet in a common face, a common face. So we need to say what do we mean by a face of a simplex. Okay, so what is a question? What is what do we mean by a face? What is a face of a simplex? Well, the answer is it, it's another uh, simplex formed by the vertices. Another uh, simplex. Can, uh, let's say the, the first simplex. Uh, let's call it uh, S. Yeah, so it's another simplex, say P, contained in S, whose vertices are um, whose uh, vertices are also vertices of. Uh, Of S. So, for example, so suppose we have a triangle simplex. So here is S, which is a two dimensional simplex. And let's give it some uh, names. So there's X, Y, Z, and, and then we have uh, edges A, B, and C. All right, so this two-dimensional simplex has, first of all, one-dimensional faces and also zero-dimensional faces. So the one-dimensional faces are the one-dimensional simplices formed by uh, X, C, and Z. That's one of them. So that simplex, that's a one simplex. And then also this one, x, y, a. And then also this one, y, z, b. And also has zero dimensional faces. Faces might be a dubious word to be using here, but it's, it's more or less standard. So zero dimensional faces, which are just the vertices x, Y and Z. What about a three dimensional simplex or tetrahedron? <coughs> so, as another example, here's a tetrahedron. I'll just give the vertices names X, Y, Z, W. And, uh, okay, I won't bother labeling the edges. So this is a three-dimensional simplex. So this has faces. First of all, it has two-dimensional uh, two faces, which are, well, the, the regular faces, what you would normally call the faces, namely this side here, x, y, and z, and then X, Z, W, and then Y, Z, W, and the one at the back, Y, W, X. So it has four, four of them. 
It also has one dimensional faces. Yeah. Is the whole simplex a face of itself? Yes, yeah, so I, I suppose technically the whole, the whole simplex will be, should be a face of itself as well. So we say it has one three dimensional face, namely itself. The one dimensional faces are just the edges, so there's six of them. Edges like a y, x, etc. And also has zero dimensional faces. And there's four of them, namely x, y, z, and w. All right, so a moment's thought uh, shows that actually we could be much more efficient than this in listing faces. That a face is completely determined by a subset of the vertices. So a face is determined by a subset of the vertices. So if the, the whole simplex is, let's say, uh, x, y, z, w, if we list its vertices, then, then the two-dimensional faces are just the simplices that you get by taking three of these points, x, y, z, or uh, X, Y, W, or Y, uh, Z, W, or we need to leave out Y, uh, X, Z, W. And the one dimensional faces are just pairs of uh, points X, Y, X, Z, etc up to ZW. The zero dimensional faces are just the subsets consisting of one vertex. And because we're in a simplex, we do not have any other conditions on these subsets. The subsets can be completely arbitrary. So we can choose any subset and we're going to get a a, a, a face, and that face, its dimension, is basically a one less than the number of elements in the subset you've chosen. So we have this nice face structure. In fact, it's almost a, it's a partially ordered set, if you like. It's a lattice. It's really the same as the lattice of subsets of the original set of vertices. So we, we, in fact, we get a, a lattice of faces in the sense of uh, partially ordered sets. And this lattice is really the same as the lattice of subsets of subsets of the vertex set. In this case, uh, x, y, z, w. But this uh, general discussion is completely independent of the dimension. It also works for higher dimensional simplices as well. All right, so we've uh, got a sense of simplices and their faces. Now we want to talk about orientation. Because when we're computing homology, we need to orient our simplices. So let's talk about orientation. Right, so, well, let's look at a, a simple a one dimensional simplex. There's the simplex by itself. When we orient it, we give it a, a direction. Let's uh, label its uh, 
vertices x and y, say. Well, maybe we'll choose, uh, we'll choose something different. We'll choose uh, v0 and v1. And we'll orient it so that it goes from v0 to v1. So this is now an oriented simplex. And I will denote that by putting them in brackets in, in the order. So I'll just write v0, v1. And now the order matters. V0 is the starting point, and then V1 is the, the next one. When I do that, I can define the boundary of this simplex. So it has boundary. Uh, so let's call this simplex something uh, S. S for simplex. Okay, so the boundary of this simplex will be Well, we'll want something consistent with what we've been doing, so we should take final minus initial, so V1 minus V0. All right, now let's have a look at a two-dimensional simplex. X, oh no, V0, V1, V2. That's a two-dimensional simplex. So we want to orient this. So there's basically two orientations that we can give it. We can either go this way, or we can go this way, or this way. Okay. There's two ways of orienting a simplex, not more. We're either going to go one way or the other way. So uh, let's uh, list the possibilities. One way would be to go V0, V1, V2. Okay. Which means that we're agreeing that we're going to go around the edges, around the vertices, first this one, then this one, then this one. Okay. And that orientation is really the same as if we cyclically permute. It's really the same as the orientation V1, V2, V0. The same as starting here, going there and there. And it's the same as going V2, V0, V1. So that's one orientation. And another orientation, well, is the opposite one, uh, this one here, where we would say start V0 and then go V2 and then go V1. And by agreement, that's the same as V2, V1, V0, which is the same as V1, uh, V0, V2. So that's another orientation. Two possibilities, just as there were two possibilities uh, for here. So we could have done this one or V1, V0, but we chose to do V0, V1. All right, let's choose one of these orientations. So let's say we'll choose the orientation, the more natural one with our labeling, that starts V0 and then goes V1 and V2. Well, that's the orientation of this one here in our diagram. Then the boundary of this, so that's our simplex, then the boundary What will the boundary of this thing be? Well, it will be a bunch of one-dimensional simplices. It should just be the, what we think of the boundary, namely this segment plus this segment plus this segment. So it should be V0, V1 plus V1, V2, plus V2, V0. And note that I'm going to rewrite this now in a certain way. I'm going to rewrite this as
V0, V1, minus V0, V2, plus V1, V2. Why am I allowed to do that? Because I'm changing the orientation of this thing. This is a segment. It's an oriented segment. I'm changing its orientation from V2 to V0 to V0, V2, and compensating by putting a minus sign instead of a plus sign. Now I'm going to write this in some other, in another form, which will be important, as a sum from I equals 0 to 2 minus 1 to the I. And now I'm going to write this as, okay, uh, v, I'll write it as V0, VI up to V2 uh, with a hat over VI, where this hat means, where hat means omit. Okay, so the, the, maybe actually this would be the first term, right? This is the term i equals zero. When i equals zero, then we have minus one to the zero, which is one, uh, times the, the v zero removed, and that's this one here. Then the next term, when i is equal to one, we get minus one to the one, which is minus one, times v zero v two, what we get when we remove the v one. And finally, when i equals 2, we've removed the v2. We're getting this term with a plus sign. All right, so we've got the boundary of a, a segment of a 1 simplex, boundary of a 2 simplex. Now let's look at the boundary of a 3 simplex. Okay, so let's um, have a look at a... 3 simplex, and I'm going to uh, label its sides v0, v1, uh, v2, v3, and it doesn't matter no, what, I, what I draw. Okay. So uh, I want to orient this thing. Okay. So I'm going to consider, this is uh, del 3. So we're going to consider the oriented simplex, oriented simplex, let's call it S, and I'm going to orient it by listing its vertices in the preferred order, in a preferred order. Namely, V0, V1, V2, V3. And I'm going to define the boundary we define the boundary by using the same formula that essentially we've used in the two previous cases. A sum from i equals 0 to 3 now, minus 1 to the i. And then we're going to take the simplex remove the ith one and, uh, and keep the rest. Okay, let's see what that looks like. So when i is zero, the coefficient is a minus one to the zero, which is one. And then we're removing v zero. So the first term is v one, v two, v three. We recognize that as a um, uh, a, two, a two simplex oriented in a familiar fashion. So where is that two simplex? That was V1, V2, V3. Here it is right here. V1, V2, V3. So in the way that I've drawn it here, on the surface of this thing here, I'm going this way around that face. Okay. Then the next term, I equals 1, there'll be a minus sign. And then I have to remove V1. So I get V0, V2, V3. Let's find that where that is. So V0 
B2, B3, but there's a minus sign in front of it. So V0, V2, V3 would be the oriented simplex that goes this way, but I've got minus sign there, so I'm getting, in fact, the one that's going this way, and this is supposed to be uh, on, the, on the back, so maybe I'll dot it, maybe make it a little bit clearer. Okay, that's the dot, that's the corresponding to the back side that we can't see. Now notice at this point that these two sides that we've already got so far have a common edge, this one here. And that along this common edge, this orientation is going in this direction, while the other one is going in the opposite direction. So we have one of the faces going this way along that common edge, while the other face is going uh, this way along that common edge. We'll just observe that. All right, the next term, the i equals 2 term, we remove the v2, there's a plus sign, so we get v0, v1, v3. Let's have a look where that is. That's the triangle at the bottom, v0, v1, v3, and we're going in this direction from v0, v1, v3, so it's this orientation, and it's all the way down the bottom, so I'll also go like this. Now notice that that side has a common side, a common uh, edge with uh, this first face. On the first face, this uh, and this side, V1, V2, V3, was going along this direction, but now this new one is actually going along this direction. So they're going in opposite directions along the common face. And actually you can see that also uh, hopefully here with this common edge between the back one and the bottom one, this one's going this way along it and this one's going this way along it. Finally, one more, minus, now we have to eliminate uh, V3, so we get V0, V1, V2, and that corresponds to V0, V1, V2, with a minus sign, so instead of going this way, we have to go this way. So, uh, maybe I'll, in solid, that's the, the face meeting us. And that's going this way along this edge, while the one behind was going this way. It's going this way along this edge while the one on the bottom was going this direction. And it's going this way along this edge while this one here was going this way. So what we see is that this orientation of the tetrahedron in terms of the faces is determined by the orientation of any one of its faces. If we knew the orientation of that one face there, then immediately that would tell us what the uh, orientation of the adjoining faces would have to be, because along the common edges, we want them to go in opposite directions. So there's ultimately really only two orientations, and there's only two pictures that we can draw. A one where the orientations are all like this, and the other ones where they're all in the opposite directions. So there's only two orientations. Uh, any one determined by a single uh, face, single faces, uh, single uh, face, uh, what's a one dimensional face orientation. And now we come to a lovely theorem. The theorem is that when we take the boundary twice, we always get zero. So theorem, del squared equals zero. Just write it like this. Uh, it's a fundamental formula in algebraic topology. Okay, so what? Let's apply. Uh, let's prove it in the case for the the case of the uh, S, the uh, 
the three-dimensional simplex that we've just calculated over here. Okay. So the boundary of S, I will repeat it, it's V1, V2, V3 minus V0, V2, V3 plus V0, V1, V3 minus V0, V1, V2. Now I'm going to take the boundary of that. So the boundary of that, by that we mean the boundary of the first thing minus the boundary of the second plus the boundary of the third minus the boundary of the fourth. Okay, what's the boundary of the first? Well, the boundary of this we said was V1, V2 plus V2, well maybe I, I could do it with plus and minuses, maybe I shall do it with plus and minuses. If we eliminate the first one, that's with a plus, so we'll get V2, V3, and then subtract the removal of the second one, so minus V1, V3, plus uh, V1, V2. Okay, that's the first thing. And then subtract the boundary of the second. So remove this one, uh, we get V2, V3, then minus V0, V3, and plus, uh, move the third one, V0, V2. And then the boundary of this one is the plus sign. So we move the first one, that's a V1, V3. Subtract, remove the second one, V0, V3. Add, remove the third one, V0, V1. And minus the boundary of the last one, which is V1, V2, minus V0, V2, plus, remove the last one, V0, V1. Do we get zero? Uh, let's look. So there's a V2, three with positive sign. There's a V2, three with minus sign. They cancel. Minus V1, V3, plus V1, V3. They cancel. V1, V2, minus V1, V2. They cancel. Um, minus V0, V3, uh, no, plus V0, V3, minus times minus is plus, and then a minus sign here, so they cancel. V0, V2 with a minus sign, and here's a V0, V2 with a plus sign, so they cancel. And finally, a V0, V1 with a plus sign, and a V0, V1 with a minus sign. Everything cancels, and we get zero. Okay, so this works for a three-dimensional tetrahedron, but it also, in fact, works for a, a, a general N simplex, and it's sort of the founding equation on which we build a homology. So next time we are going to start building homology with these simplices, using these very explicit boundary operators going from a simplex to a combination of its faces in one dimension less. So I'll see you then.